Hi, good afternoon. I'm Nico Slebus. I work for a company called The Pace Systems. We mostly working in the medical aid industry. So we are the middleman between your service providers, um, like the doctors, the pharmacies, hospitals, and your medical aids. So we get the electronic claim from the pharmacy, we give it to the medical aid, and we get the response back from them, and then the pharmacist will tell you whether the claim has been paid, uh, what your co-payments and whatever reasons there might be for rejections. Okay, today I'm going to talk to you about XML external entity vulnerabilities. It is something that's been around for quite a while, but in the, the last few years it sort of got less attention, I think, than it should have, but it's picking up again basically, basically because of RESTful web services as well, where you can either process XML or JSON um, data payloads. So, firstly, a disclaimer. Okay, I'm not one of those. I'm not a cryptographic expert. I'm no black hat, white hat, pink hat, whatever they call them these days, nor any security expert. I just try and take security seriously when we do development. So that's the angle I will be um, using for this talk today then. Okay, so we're going to talk about what is XML external entities, um, who's vulnerable to one of these attacks, and there's quite a few of these attacks that you can launch against any servers. Um, how to fix it, and then we're gonna sh I'm going to show you a few things that we can actually do um, just on my local machine here, but um, you'll get a picture of what you can actually do if you get to the full extent of what you, um, if we actually get access to a server that, that way. Okay, firstly, um, a definition for the external entities, and it's going to take me a while to get there, I just need to clarify a few things up front. So, an uh, XML document allows you to define what they call a DTD. Okay, so that document type definition allows you to specify the structure of how your XML file would look, um, but it's not widely used anymore. Since they invented the XSD, the XML schema definition, it's basically replaced the DTDs. You can do so much more with the XSD that you can do with a um, DTD. Okay, but this DTD allows you to define XML entities. Um, so you, you provide a substitution string in the form of a URI for, a, for an entity, um, and then the XML parser can actually go and access that content of that URI, whether that can be a, just a st literal string, or it can be some URI to a remote server or a local file system. What then happens is that entity content is then replaced inside the XML document where you reference that entity. So there's several types of entities that, um, oh sorry, I'm ahead of myself here, sorry. Okay, so an e XML external entity attack um, targets an application that passes XML input. Okay, so that XML input then contain a reference to what they call an external entity, and that is then processed by a weekly or a um, insecure configured XML parser. Right, now, when you do all of this, you can do a few things. You can either disclose confidential data. Um, you can actually, I'll, and I'll, one of the demos I'll show you is a denial of service that you can actually launch against a server. Um, you can do server-side request forgeries so that you can hide yourself and um, make it more difficult for the system administrators to actually find out from where the, the attack is coming. And you can then also do port scanning with this. Okay, so like I said, the DTD is widely available, but no one actually uses it anymore, and it's a feature that is by default enabled in most of the XML parsers. All right, so now a few entities. Um, there's predefined entities. I think we've all seen those before in HTML documents and wherever, the ampersand, less than, greater than signs. Then there's internal entities. I'll show you examples of these next. Then external entities. Um, then internal and external parameter entities. Okay, so an internal entity. 
um, that declares a variable, and there you have a string literal for it. Uh, okay, if, okay. This is not working like a. Uh, okay, so the string literal will then just contain the word internal entity. External entities actually is nothing much different from internal entity. It just allows you to reference. Um, or the, uh, sorry, sorry. The external entity then just provides the additional URI. So you still got a variable external. Then there's got what they call a system literal. Is either the system or public. And then that two keywords allows you to follow that with a URI that then the XML parcel will access. General entities, um, they just make use of an ampersand to reference um, one of these variables. So you'll s in the DTD, you'll declare the um, entity, and in your XML, you will actually reference that entity. And that f will be replaced by the XML password with this is foo in your XML document then. All right, then param parameterized entities, they assign values to other entities. So you can now actually go and set up a lot of variables if you want to, and the one can reference the other one, and so you can carry on. So there's just our normal internal entity. There's your another entity that makes a reference to that entity, and again, that will be replaced with this is foo. All right, so how does this thing actually work in an attack? So you, def you submit an XML file then that defines an external entity with either, for example, a file URI that then um, make the application read that content of that file. Right, for example, you can in Windows you can access, try and access the WinINI file. On Unix boxes, etc password or any other actually file system you can access on the file system. But if you get clever and using HTTP in your URIs, you can actually access remote content on other servers that's inside the same network than the one that you're attacking. All right. Um, I mean, this helps also where you can then attack that server internally from within the own network. I mean, normally system admins are geared for the tax, the attacks from outside their system. I don't think everyone is geared up for attacks coming from internal to their own systems, which will make this just so much easier to attack, but more difficult to detect. All right. This uh, also, I mean, you bypass firewall restrictions, you hide the sources. Um, once the XML parser has read the content of that URI, it is then um, processed by the XML parser and fed back to the application. You can either, depending on the service you're accessing, um, it might echo the data back to you, or you might see results in terms of error messages then coming back. And if you have a service, for example, that doesn't give you your content back that you submitted, or in some way or another, you can actually send that data to another command and control server, where you can then see what you actually accessed through that attack. Now the big question, who's vulnerable? Well, any application that passes an XML document. It doesn't need to be a service that's exposed on the internet for web services, whether it's REST or SOAP, web services, doesn't matter. If you have a, a standalone application that processes an XML document, you can still use it to gain information out of that attack. Um, so any application that uses a weekly or unsecure um, parser will be vulnerable to this, and it will be able to resolve external entities within DTTs as well. Now, if we look at the languages available to us, um, there's just a list of some of the parsers that's around. Um, I don't think I need to really say much more than the red is the bad ones and the 
green, yellow is sort of the ones that secure the moment. Um, some of them only from specific versions, for example, in .NET, there's only from the .NET framework 4.52, where, where these um, passes are safe. In C, C++, there's mainly the two libxml2 um, two from version 2.9 onwards. Um, I'll get back to Java just in a moment. Okay, PHP, there's a libxml, Python has got a few. There's probably more for PHP and Python that I could find in a, the quick search that I did for it. Um, I have to say, it's a sorry state if you're using Java, you've got a lot more work to do. Um, because there's actually a longer list. There's a few more. Okay, there's only the one safe parser at the moment in, um, in the Jacks B specification. Um, where that module is safe since Java 8 beta 86. Okay, Java 8 is around now for quite a while, so, but, and again, most of the web services that you, if you do it properly, you don't pass just strings. If you pass objects correctly, you should use the JAXB um, marshaller and unmarshaller in any case. All right. Okay, so what can we do to avoid these vulnerabilities. Right, there's a few of them, I'll just quickly put them up. Okay, so the obvious one, don't allow any processing of DTDs. Um, they're not really used anymore, there's really no use for them. So just make, disable it and make your life easier. If you do have to pass DTDs, then don't expand entities. There's settings for all of these things to do. So. Um, if you have to expand entities, don't resolve externals, for example. If you may get large XML documents, make sure you limit your pass depth, that you don't go, say, five or 10 or 20 levels deep into an XML document before you read the next record, for example. Limit your input size. I mean, you don't wanna have someone upload in a web service a file of 20 meg. I mean, that's just not necessary. I don't think there's any web services around that need that much of data per request. Um, also, your, your pass time. I mean, even a small document can take a long time to pass if it's constructed correctly, and that's one of our, you'll see in the examples how that you, how you can do that. Then again, if you have large data, make use of a SAX parser that reads element for element and not the whole document in one go, we have got now suddenly got a document of 20 meg in memory. Make your memory usage as small as possible as well. Again, and that's basically untrusted sources, whether you're using XPath or XSL transformation, if you don't know who you're getting this information from, don't trust it. So before you do any of these things, if you have to evaluate XPath expressions or apply transformations, put that document through a, a safe parser first and know that whatever you received is actually something that you can work with and won't cause you any harm. Right, now let's see. Substituting entities, um, like I said, that's just a normal internal entity that we're gonna use. Um, so we define an entity, define an entity foo, oh sorry, that's an element name that references that main XML element, then there's an entity called bar with a string literal of world. So if we say hello and reference that entity bar, we should get hello world out of this XML document. Right, that's the expected output we, you would expect from that passing that document before I go to the second one so that I can just show you that um, all right there's that um, document in passed by a, 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 a a RESTful web, uh, sorry, that's not, 
that's a yeah that's a restful web service there um just for interesting sake i am printing out a few headers because i want to come back to that we'll get back to the response code again um for one of the examples okay so taking the substituting entities a bit further um you can do that so now you've got an entity t1 which reference to two entities bar of the bar entity twice so every time you now expand t1 when it's used there there will be two of these right so so it carries on carries on so by the end when t3 has been fully expanded and it's substituted here there's actually the the world the, the word world has been substituted 40 times okay see where this is going Okay, that's one. Now, there's an attack that is called the billion laughs. It's a small document. I mean, that's all XML. Okay, there's 10 references on each of these lines and all reference lol, okay? So, but this thing becomes exponential. If I remember correctly, that is actually, I think it expanded to actually, like the, like the name says, a billion um, entity references that it's expanded. The moment you put that through the parser, that's what happens to your CPU. Now this, I couldn't, I w was trying to get this thing to actually process a lot longer, but it, because in the, while that thing is busy, while that request is busy parsing, you can't submit any other request in that time. That thing finishes just a bit too quickly to, to show you all the steps, but if you've got some of these things in a loop, you can keep that server busy forever. No other request will, will be process while your CPU is doing that. Okay, there's the CPU going. Uh, just see. Alright, that's the service side where it received that request. And it's probably going to error out before I can do anything. Yeah, okay. Okay, that rate is difficult. But it's... Uh, come on. I'm looking for okay that's why I said earlier one of the things you need to try and do is limit the use of your memory see that's what the thing just that it just causes out of memory error and your server is down in a matter of a few seconds And it's, as, you, as I've shown you, I mean, it's really easy to actually fix this. Um, uh, we can 
close that. Okay, so when you actually submit one of these requests to a server that has been fixed, um, you'll get an error, a message that says the doc type is disallowed when this feature, and that's the whole string you have to give the parsers in Java now, not to, the, to um, evaluate the doc types, is set to true. Okay, but now, see what the server responds with, with a 400 bad request. All right, and it doesn't affect any of your processing um, further on. Okay, now let's say you want to send data back to a server, so you have you don't n normally see the output of your XML document in the response that you get back. You can then use a command control server to read the file and send that data back to your server. So we'll submit the XML file. It references an external entity called file, which will read the ETC hostname file. All right, that then will also pass that DTD, okay, which it downloads from the server as well. And then that server just gives it the U uh, um, DTD, just gives it the URL to which it should send the data or know that content of that file. Okay, so, like I said, you don't get any response back from the server. There's nothing content length zero, but we've got a status 200, so everything is happy with it. On the server now, we can see, um, yeah, everything is, yeah. Right, there's the XML we send it, and there's the actual headers. You can print out the headers that you just, um, for the request. We can see what it accepts, the connection type, the user agent, Java version, for example. Some of the times when it depends on what you use. I mean, you can get a lot more information about the user, in user agent, which would give away a lot more information. Whether it's an Apache web server, Nginx, you can get some of those details as well. Right, and then this file, oh, okay, and then the host name is just Gemsbok. Right, that's in the ETC host name. As with the um, example of the billion laughs, another way of actually gaining information from the server is by using error messages, and that just throws off the XML parser, but sometimes in the response that's then returned to you, you see information that you actually don't need to see or w weren't supposed to see in the first place. So we'll send another file again to the same server, and it will output some HTML. There's a lot I'll show it to you now, but you'll get the, there's a basic HTML page with a lot of other information inside it that you weren't expecting. Okay, in this case by now, I mean, you all know that I'm using Java here, but see there's even a bit of style sheets, there's, uh, I think, an image. 
Um, I mean, that's not something you really expect when you submit an XML document for a server for processing. In that stack traces as well, I mean, you can get enough information from it. Um, let's see what we've got there. Yeah, I mean, there's... If you know enough org.jboss, you know that's actually part of Red Hat, which is an application server that um, JBoss develops. Um, REST Easy is the RESTful web services implementation. So you immediately know a few things about the application sitting behind this RESTful web service. Now, it's easy enough. This doesn't give away version numbers, but if you, for example, can obtain the version number for REST Easy, you can go and search if there's any known vulnerabilities that can give you maybe further access to do remote co command execution or actually do more worse things than what I've shown you so far. So that's also why it's sometimes input, there is ways in the application as well to avoid this. I know sometimes you get lazy people, they don't catch the exceptions when they're programming, and that's when this happens. All right. Now then, parameterized entities. Now this is where the fun starts, I hope. Okay, again we're going to try and read files, but now we're going to make it try and read the etc password file. What I'm actually going to do is just run that thing. There's a few. It will actually execute um, two requests. I actually did the third one as well. All right. But now let's see what we've got here. Okay, so I've now managed to read the ETC password file on my machine. Right there, so I liked it. Okay, but now the interesting thing starts. ETC group. I've just grabbed to where, my ne where I'm part of whatever groups I'm part of. I've removed a few, but how important is that one? You're part of the wheel group. No one needs root access. If you can access my account on my laptop, you've got root access. Now, what that thing also, uh, the third part of it, um, you see what's there? What did I access there? That's my private key. SSH, SSH private key on my local machine. How many of you use different SSH keys for different logins? One. So all of us, may, you use the same one. It's too difficult to remember passphrases and whatever. Okay, but now I've just given you access to my machine. Okay, I'll put that one back. Um. Okay, so let's save that. Okay, there's the private key. We just need to fix that permission. Um, okay, I know this isn't the, the best scenario because I'm now going to SSH in from my own machine into onto my own machine, but you'll get an idea. I've got now that private key because it's the same one. Your public key sit in your authorized keys file, right? All of us. All I now need to do is this. I have the username. I know the host name. 
or the IP address but we'll just go there okay and that's the right now what do you want to do in the wheel group um even if you sometimes i mean if you're lazy you do this Okay, so there you've got root access to my machine. Um, right. So if you fix that, again, you should just get that response. Shouldn't be able to get my private key. Okay. Um, any questions? Yes. I'm um, just wait for the mic. The, the. Hi. Um, so I'm just wondering how often do you see like people using DTD instead of XSDs in the wild? Um, in the last. 15 odd years that I've been programming, I haven't seen a DTD used in an XML document. Okay. Only XSDs. Um, so then, and this is only limited to when you use a DTD. Yeah. Okay. So because that I allows mean, you to, to access external resources, which I'm sure there is ways of doing it with an XSD as well. Probably by using an XSD include command, you might be able to do some of these things. I haven't looked at that, but there might be ways of abusing the XSD as well to do this. Yeah, so, I mean, this is a pretty hectic attack. You showed us to how easy you can get root access, but the risk is quite minimal as long as you don't use DTDs. Correct, yeah, yes. Yeah. I mean, all of this depends on how, how that machine is configured as well. I mean, if you, if you disallow or have to... Um, What's the word I'm looking at? Oh, the, um, the discipline to use different SSH keys, um, you limit your risk as well. Um, for example, if you have to use a DTD, make or download it once and I have a local copy of it in your application. Then you know it's safe for use. I mean, I do that with all the XSDs from web services that I consume. I don't trust them to give me that XSD the whole time. I keep a local copy. If they want to change it, then fine. Let the, if the application break, so be it. But I know that I'm not downloading something that I haven't physically looked at and verified that there's nothing in there that shouldn't be in there. Right. Thank you. Hi, Nico. Hi. Um, so I have a question. Uh, this is, will affect you more if you are consuming web services, but do you know of any compromised software that we are using in our open source, or is it one, fixed? Um, one of the examples in that list, I'll go back to it, uh, didn't say much about it. Um, on Python, for example, one of the things I found with the Python um, libraries there was a specific one um, where they use Python docx, where you can actually read open office documents, even Microsoft Word documents, because I mean, all in the end, that's XML documents. So there were vulnerabilities in that library in the Python docx library. So that's if you just received a file via email uh, or somehow process it with Python, you could actually compromised yourself. Yeah, that's good to know we're actually using that. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so but I, I guess you're not using that version. Yeah. But it's important since we are consuming a lot of people's web services and it could be yes. compromised in any way. So yeah. it's not something you will be aware of easily mm. unless made aware. And like the thing is, web services all over the place. I mean, our phones use RESTful web services probably every two seconds in during the day. 
there's someone somewhere something listening to a web service call that we make somehow in that in i mean in organizations if it's a b2b application i mean you probably have inherent and trust in whatever you pass between two parties because there is some testing involved but if you say amazon and you have a web services exposed to the world I mean, you can't go and test with every few million people in the world that make sure that they're going to send you something that's valid. I mean, there's probably weather services out there that would return to you the weather conditions that a specific place in the world. I mean, you can send them, send them a billion laughs and see what they do with it. More questions? Nikki, thank you very much. Um, just a recommendation. You're going to change your private key after this, eh? Hey? Because you know it's on video. Yeah, no, no, that one is, okay. th that one is going to disappear quickly. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I mean, something else that you can probably use. Um, what I didn't show you was that it uses the default um, private key name, id underscore RSA. I mean, that's the default file name that's generated when you generate the key. But give, when you generate your key, give it a different file name. Because then they have to guess what that file name is to download it. Um, something else that springs to mind is more modern APIs and web services are using JSON. Um, I don't see a big uptake on JSON schema as a way of doing validation, but that contains a reference. Um, any thoughts on, on references in JSON? I haven't or JSON schema, maybe? I, I know it's not very popular. But I know, and I think yeah. it's, it is because it's, a, I don't know, I find it difficult to generate JSON schemas, and it's not. So I don't, I don't yeah. see the same flexibility out of that I get out of XSD. Mm. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure what the tax are possible. There's probably a tax possible with JSON I was just looking schemas. at it now. You could at least, you know, call out to a different server and Pro at least probably ping it. Probably easily. You know, that's yeah. at least one idea. I mean, yeah. you can then get inside it and access files in on the LAN. When, when I first started reading about this a few, I think about a year ago, something I tried and I never really finished was to look, because I know Microsoft Word has got a lot of XML types, and I was just messing around with it. I haven't gotten um, to a point where what I thought might be cool is if I want to get no guarantee that someone's opened up a document, mm. um, you know, maybe because I know, I think it does use um, DDTs, I think. Um, I don't know anyway, what it's just, just a thought. I don't know if, yeah, if, you, if you've mean, played with that really. No, I haven't. But I mean, just something that came to mind. I mean, how easy will it be to just even? Okay, it depends on what they what the settings is on macros, for example. I mean, you mm. can write the Visual Basic macro to do it. Yeah. Um, but I but I guess macros are known for the issues, so most people probably have it disabled if they keep stuff up to date. Right. Thank you.